In this episode of Investors and Operators, I speak with Patty Melcher, co-founder and managing partner at EIV Capital, a Houston-based private equity firm specialized in growth equity to the North American energy industry. EIV has over $1.8 billion of assets under management, 27 portfolio investments since 2007, and recently closed fund four at just over $700 million. Patty, it is awesome to finally have you on the show. And my first question is, what is the difference between fund one, Patty, and fund for Patty? Yeah, it's a lot of growth, a lot of growth. So um, when we started fund one, uh, my co-founder uh, put up most of the capital. It was a friends and family round. It was 2009, so just coming off the financial um, crisis. And so very difficult to raise industri- uh, institutional capital. So we had 50 million and I said, well, let's go invest it. And so um, uh, he trusted me to go invest it. We had a, uh, we were structured formally with our documents, but uh, informally with our team, uh, people that I had worked together with. Um, and so we went and invested it. We were undercapitalized. We did an, uh, several investments where we were just a, a minority participator, although we were often and, and typically quite involved in the companies. We like uh, doing growth equity. Uh, we we, we are uh, focused only on the energy industry. We all have deep experience in the ener- energy industry. And our, our focus for our investments was primarily uh, midstream infrastructure, pipelines, gas processing plants, et cetera. Um, so at that time, there was uh, limited capital. Um, and so we had identified a number of quite good opportunities invested that it did quite well. And so we used that as our track record. Uh, and so f- to go raise our second fund, which was in about 270 million that we closed in 2014. And so getting ready, going from f- fund one to fund two, uh, there was a lot of preparation and formalizing things and bringing on people officially. I went and, and brought in um, uh, a new partner. Um, uh, so, um, so we would be ready for that. And uh, th- so there was quite a bit of change uh, from fund one. Uh, we were a lot less formal. And now we have 25 people. We just closed our fourth fund at 700 million. And our the culture and the approach hasn't changed, but we just um, are more intentional about a lot of the things we do. So um, what, what were some of the key lessons from fund one? And when you're really you know, learning how to do this and in getting this off the ground with your team, what, what were some of the key lessons that emerging managers should really have front of mind in one, how they're thinking about their team, two, maybe fundraising and how to be effective, and three, how to be a quality partner with the portfolio companies. Yeah. So we came at it much differently than most new funds. So I started in energy investment banking back in the mid 80s. I started with one of the early uh, energy focused private equity uh, firms in 1989, um, was there for some, uh, five years and then went non-traditional, which we can talk about later. So. I had always planned to come back into private equity and then had this opportunity. Uh, So I was not just a spin off of some existing fund. So I'd been out of that traditional PE market for some time. Uh, So things had changed a lot, but we came at it as investors. So I had been investing, um, you know, ever since I had started in private equity. Um, my co-founder had comes from commodity trading, but he had backed many management teams who were growing companies. And I'd started several companies of my own along the way too. So this was all about starting a new company. One, when you're going 
to start a new firm, uh, if you're thinking about starting a new private equity firm, first thing is you have to be prepared to support yourself and your team uh, for at least a couple of years. I would aim for two to three minimum, which really guides who you can bring on, right? So uh, you've got to have partners that you've worked with before is really helpful. They need to be able to support themselves. Um, it takes it takes some time. So we, um, I was lucky enough to kind of step into a situation where I had worked with my my co-founder before. Uh, so I didn't have to go through some of those steps, but to get to that institutional raise, we had to show that track record. So if you're starting a new fund as an emerging manager, you know, the competition is fierce. They, there's not that many teams that do get funded each year, either for um, emerging manager or any manager who's starting. The LPs want to see existing deals. They want to see a track record, even if you're just getting started. If you've been at other funds, you can often pull that track record or they can back into it. Uh, but they also just want you to have one or two real deals in hand that you've already invested in. So this whole chicken and egg of how do you get money if you don't have money? Um, so it, it is definitely a challenge and it's something you need to think about and plan for, um, just like starting any company. Um, well, to that we, point on, on, in terms of starting, I haven't asked this question on other episodes, but who should not start their own firm given yeah. the context and who, what are the, what are the reality check questions that we need to have right now that we need to go through to say, listen, don't do this. And here's why. So I've often been approached um, a number of times, but you know, people are thinking about going out and starting their own company, whatever that is. And when they tell me they don't like having a boss and that's why they want to start their own company, um, but they do want a salary, they want all these things. I'm like, okay, first of all, you go from having one boss to having everybody's your boss, your investors, your vendors, your portfolio companies, your board, your, your, your employees, everybody is going to be telling you what they think you should be doing. Um, so I think it's and, and and you can't say well, I've got to I've got to get paid this much because I've got a, this big mortgage and I just bought a new car and I've got you know you've got to have lived below your means for a num you know for as many years as you've been doing whatever because you've got to have that nest egg to support yourself to um, to give yourself that breathing room to really start your company. And in private equity, you're expected to put money in immediately. You know, you're not, you're not just getting paid, you've got to invest alongside. Uh, so you need additional capital there. Uh, so, you know, you've really got to believe in yourself. You've got to believe that, you know, here's what I want to go do. If you knew how hard it was going to do, going to be, most people would never do it. That's a good thing is you just usually don't know what you don't know, which is, has its pluses and minuses. But, um, you know, it, people will tell you starting a management company uh, for, uh, for a PE firm, you know, it's typically eight to 10 years before you're really profitable, you know, because you keep having to reinvest and reinvest and reinvest. That's a long time. Uh, if you're, you know, working at a, at a, at a, a private equity um, fund or firm that's doing well, you can make a lot of current cash flow um, by your just getting salary and then hopefully you're earning on your on your carry but um you've got to be willing to invest and really think for where you're going to be long term and i, I think that just brings up such a interesting point about entrepreneurship that you know we've really reflected on the past five years on the reasons why we do it and because you know to your point if you knew what was going to happen you probably wouldn't do it yeah. it it, it it becomes more about the journey as opposed to a financial success because it's either fleeting or high probability it doesn't happen. And it's really about that journey. And to your point about not having a boss, like I used to think that, but yeah, you have the customers, you have your team, you have, you know, your investors, you do have, you have more bosses. It gets more complicated. Um, I found that the reason why we have done it is 
now at year five of entrepreneurship, it's about the uh, freedom of time mm -hmm. and to be able to say, we want to build in this direction and we're going to get the upside, but we're also going to get the downside. But at least we have the, the, the ability to choose what direction we want to build and how to spend the day. And I, I don't know what you face, you know, when you were first getting this off, but you know, five years ago when there was no structure, it was, what do I do with my time? <laughs> how do I wait? I, I have to actually create the structure. <laughs> and so, but I think it really came back down to the freedom of what to do with time and how to build in the direction that we wanted to. What are some of the maybe, maybe early hurdles or fumbles that, you know, looking back, you know, it's just some really good practical advice that uh, emerging managers can kind of think through either in how you constructed the team or how you worked with the portfolio or how you interacted with investors? So first you have to have a good vision or, you know, you, you, why are you doing this? What is it you want to do? You know, for, for me, I've always been in the energy industry. I love the energy industry. I think it's very important. And I also love building companies. I love that growth, that and then that development, um, and seeing um, management teams blossom and really build build businesses with value that uh, can hire people, employ people, and then do things right. So, thinking about you know there are things that I would not invest in. There are teams I would not invest in. You know you have to be aligned with. How do you think about business? We're very collaborative. If someone is just looking for money and doesn't want any advice, then they don't need it. We're not a good match for them. And there's plenty of good places to go. But it's also for me, it's who you work with. And I've always chosen where I've gone to work based on, you know, not only just what the job is, you know, what it pays, what it, you know, all the typical things, but it's who are you going to be working with? Are they people that you respect, admire, that you're going to learn from and that you're going to be proud to associate with? And so that's the other thing about starting your own company. You get to choose who you work with and you get to set the culture. And so, you know, I, I hear stories about cultures and environments where people have to go to work every day. And I'm just thankful that I've been able to get to choose. Um, I never expected to start my own company, had no intention of it, really didn't, you know, it, I was not always looking to go do that. Um, but life, is, you know, life gets in the way sometimes. And so it led me down a path. And then it turned out to be a good fit for me to, to, to do that. Um, and I don't know, I can, this goes into some of the things later, but. Um, yeah, well, I guess a side question in terms of choose people you work with. Uh, one is, are you hiring in what positions and why should people join? Yeah. So, um, you know, our, our mission and our vision is to work with growing companies. And so we, we focus on what I call the lower middle market and providing growth equity. And so, um, We've been able to grow our fund size, which means we can invest in more companies, which does mean we need more people. So we've actually grown. If you'd asked me 10 years ago when we started, if we'd have 25 people today, I would probably said, no, we won't need that many people, but we continue to grow and it's been wonderful. And one of the things is that we, we because we work so closely with the companies, we have not only uh, the typical private equity investment team professional that comes from investment banking and, and energy finance, but also those with deep operational and engineering backgrounds. And so we bring that team approach uh, to our companies, but it means we need uh, a team with more horsepower and more people. Um, so we always seem to be hiring. Um, we always, of course, are hiring at the associate level uh, and matriculating up. But as we continue to, to, to grow, um, you know, encourage anyone who has that, um, you know, we all do look for someone with energy experience because we are in such a cyclically driven in industry that that's important. Um, but we we're hiring um, in our back office on the 
controller and accounting side, and then we're hiring on the um, operational team. And we always are looking for, for people as we grow our, our finance team. So, Got it. Well, let's go back to that question on the difference between fund one versus fund four. And I'm curious how you are a better investor now than fund one. What do you think has changed in the way that you go through your process and with the team? So a lot of our process is actually the same. We spend a lot of time upfront getting to know the management team, do the due diligence. Um, when we were going through the early part of the shale revolution, there was a lot more greenfield infrastructure, building new things. So backing a team, getting to know them, being sure we are aligned, and then working with them to go find those growth projects and then to fund them. Um, as we evolve and then, um, you know, um, we, also invest in existing companies, either acquiring existing assets um, or, or, or companies. And so again, but we spend a lot of time to first be sure we're really aligned. How has your investment mentality and mm -hmm. personal approach evolved within energy investing? So, so I, I guess one thing is, you, you know, over the last few years, my patience has gotten a little shorter. So <laughs> where we're, you know, sometimes we mount, you see some of the same old things again, or like, okay, we're not going to be as collaborative in this particular point. We're going to make them put in an ERP the first year, you know, or they've got to have a CFO versus before a lot of times we were providing more of that CFO function. Um, but it, it's, it, you know, one of the things I learned early um, is I think you have to trust your management team. You know, they know the business the best, right? So it's, we have a lot of experience also because we've seen multiple companies that we've grown. So there's always this push-pull about when do you, you know, not push yourself on to them of like, okay, no, we really need to go this way because I can see this, you know, this roadblock coming. Um, whereas the management team may be going, no, we need to go this way. So um, uh, I would say- So do you think that the difference is that there's not a black and white difference on, it's about how to better manage that push and pull with management? Yeah, it's, it's maybe, um, you know, yeah, being less patient sometimes just saying, no, we've got to go ahead and, and push this way, trust us. And trust is critical. Um, so trusting your team, trusting each other, uh, and that's part of the whole culture. We want our investors to trust us that we're going to take care of their money and do what we think is right and do it for their benefit. Um, and then for the portfolio companies, building trust with the management team is just critical. Because if they don't trust us, they're not going to tell us things. They're not going to tell us something's going wrong until it's gotten, you know, into a really big mess. If, if everyone discloses, hey, this is not going the way we thought it was. And if you do that early, then we can all get in a room and say, okay, let's try this or that. Um, that is so much better. But if, you're, if your management teams don't trust you, they're not going to do that. So on the other side, I think maybe that's what I'm saying is that sometimes we're saying, look, I know you disagree, but trust us on this. Just go with us on this. And let's, you know, even though you don't maybe quite agree with us because we've seen this and we've been in this situation multiple times. And um, I think that's where that's probably a change of, of over the last couple of funds. Um, now I'm more willing to say, look, just just give us the benefit of the doubt on this decision. Um, and I think that it so far has pretty much turned out, you know, because we, we've, we've, so whereas the management team may not have come up against that situation a couple of times. I love that. It's, it's really interesting just to kind of reflect back on how we grow as managers, leaders, the decision-making 
And maybe shifting gears a little bit, there are some headlines in the news about Mm -hmm. Russia and Ukraine, and that is impacting energy prices. It is impacting what we are paying at the pump. But I'm curious because you've been in this industry for over 20 years, and you've seen not just the energy cycles, but you've seen economic cycles, you've seen global conflict cycles. So what what's the big picture here with the Russia-Ukraine crisis? What is the short-term and long-term impact on the U.S. and, and global energy? Yeah. So I hate to admit this, but it's more like over 35 years I've been in the industry. <laughs> um, That's why you said 20 plus. <laughs> that was very kind. But I think um, the energy industry has always been very cyclical. And to be a good investor in energy, you have to acknowledge that and you have to think about how you invest to limit your downside and your exposure to commodity prices. But that's a different uh, that's a different topic. So we have seen these cycles. They've been driven by different things. We have had wars that have run invasions that have driven up um, uh, oil prices significantly. Um, you know, that is the industry, you know, that's the market sign for everyone to, to pull back on their demand to help balance it. What's different this time, um, not that we won't, again, be cyclical, but a new, the new twist on this is the push for ESG and climate change. And so um, the oil and gas industry in America has been being um, disassembled. Uh, and new capital uh, from investors is going into energy transition, which I think is great. Uh, but I think both po- certainly the energy industry knows this well, politicians and a lot of people know it well, even though they don't talk about it, is we cannot transition to uh, renewable um, solar, wind, uh, batteries, electric uh, vehicles overnight. And there's a lot of industries that cannot run on solar or wind. You cannot produce um, cement or aluminum without, to date, a a fossil fuel. Uh, Maybe, you know, nuclear or something could do it. Uh, So this has become very clear. Also, energy security is now back on the table. So over the last, you know, since the mid 20th century, we've spent billions every year to protect our energy security. And that's why we were so involved with the Middle East for so many decades and spent so much money there. With the shale revolution, we have essentially become energy independent in the US, which is amazing. And it's actually an absolute amazing um, because we, we never thought this would occur again if you go back 20 years. Um, when, when did we really start as a country to get that political movement and also the dollars to become energy independent? When did that really start? So, well, so I think I was hearing someone say that the last time we were a net exporter of, of, of energy, oil and gas, was back in like the 1950s. And so then our demand for energy for fossil fuels has increased every year since then. Um, If a lot of people may remember uh, peak oil was in the early 2000s going into 2007, was we had limited uh, oil and gas. We would, uh, we had reached the peak. and, um, And so that's when oil prices last went to like $150. Uh, George Mitchell, uh, who people laughed at for years, had this thing called, um, he he was really taking uh, fracking, which has been around since the 50s, and applying it horizontally to access oil and gas that's been in um, the rock, uh, you know, one to two miles below the Earth's surface for years, for millennia, and figured out how to economically produce that. So that's the shale and the fracking. So first, that was applied to natural gas. And then it was around the early 2010, say, 
that it started being applied to oil. And then that's where you get this huge run up in oil. All of a sudden we're awash in oil and we become energy independent and, and at very reasonable prices. Now, the energy industry ignored the, the impact to the environment. I think a lot of people didn't understand it. Uh, they finally gotten with the program and acknowledged there are a lot of emissions and there's a lot of cleanup going on. And I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see um, greenhouse gas and other emissions significantly reduced by people paying attention, doing the right thing, and, and, and just realizing that that it's not good for the environment, plus you're wasting a precious resource. Um, so here, we now are in a position where we can produce enough oil and gas to get us through energy transition. And what's really amazing is here, we have the administration turning to Venezuela and to Iran for increased uh, oil and gas. Uh, and I think there are a lot of political reasons for that. Uh, whereas um, the industry in the US is, is still is can, being shamed and, and being shut in. And um, all of a sudden people are again realizing, well, there is a reason for, for using fossil fuels for yep. energy security. When you look at what crop prices are gonna do, um, I think, um, you know, Almost all crops use fertilizer, which most of which is coming from natural gas, which with natural gas prices going up to 20, 30, hundred dollars in MMBTU uh, due to shortages of, of natural gas due to the war. Um, you, a lot of fertilizer plants have gotten shut in, which means next year when people start planting crops, they're not gonna be able to produce as much crops. So I think we're gonna have a lot of, of um, repercussions from the Ukraine conflict uh, that will- That are just gonna play out nine months, 12 months. Yeah. And so the prices of corn, the prices of the food supply chain is gonna continue to go up in the next 12 to 18 months. And and all, you know, steel and aluminum and all these things that get made uh, with, you know, they have to have energy to produce them. Do you uh, think that their homes? I mean, it's very, you know, a lot of people having probably a lot of difficulty to pay those prices. And is that just because this is not a temporary impact? This is a. So the, what we say in the energy industry is the cure for high prices or high prices. <laughs> just like we cure for low prices or low prices. So, you know, it is a signal for people to cut back. Um, energy cannot be turned on, or oil and gas cannot be turned on in a, on a dime, right? When it, you have to go out, you have to drill new wells, you have to plan them, you have to design them, you have to go get the service companies. A lot of service companies have gone bankrupt. Um, people have left. Um, the industry. And so it, it just takes a while to turn it on. It's not like just turning on, on, on the taps. Um, and so I don't know how long it'll take it. Hopefully the, the, if you, hopefully the Ukraine, uh, crisis will, you know, it would be fabulous if, if, if they could come to a resolution, um, quickly, which that's, that's the best way to solve the problem. Well, let's, let's, um, go to a, a different topic, which is, you know, running a firm and working with regulation. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's front and center in our industry that the SEC is changing our reporting and disclosure requirements. So what I'm interested in is the practical impact to smaller fund managers, you know, uh, one or two billion and under and kind of what this actually means and how smaller fund managers are, are thinking about, um, you know, being able to comply with those new reporting and disclosure requirements. What does this actually mean to your business? How many more people, how many more outside advisors, general costs, or what, how, are, how are you thinking about this? Yeah, so it, that's just a fact of life. You know, you grow your business and you will have more regulation. And so we... Um, 
you know, in our first fund, there wasn't much because we were 50 million uh, uh, as a fund size. And at that time, there, there wasn't a whole lot of reporting that we had to do. As soon as we went above that, then we had more requirements. Um, so we could first do those internally with our accounting, our CFO slash chief, compl <laughs> chief compliance officer. I remember how I used to do chief, I used to be the chief. I was about to say, am I looking at the former chief compliance officer? <laughs> yes. And then... Um, I remember uh, Jenny, one of my partners, one of my first partners, I, uh, we were coming back from a trip on an airplane. I got her some wine and then I uh, asked her once she'd had one or two on the airplane, if she would be the chief compliance officer next. So <laughs> she became it. And then, <laughs> Way to soften the blow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then uh, as we grew, luckily enough, we were able to hire uh, an experienced um, uh chief financial officer and she had done compliance. So she became the chief compliance officer and, and remains so to this day. And it's very important. I mean, you, it is tone at the top and how important it is to do things right. Um, is, you know, that's what we, the tone we want to set. As we continue to get larger, we are spending more. Um, so first we used a smaller consultant to help us with some things. And I think we're now on our third consultant and each one has gotten um, a lot more expensive, but a lot more capable. Uh, and because you have to be fully compliant, you have to be sure you're doing everything the way the SEC wants you to do, that you are doing, maintaining all your records uh, and you have to be able to produce. Um, I mean, I, you know, we, we run mock audits. It's like, okay, everyone came to compliance training. Show me where everyone signed in. You know, you have to know where all your documents are. And then um, we are going over the 2 billion mark. That's another level of compliance. And so we have to get more information for our, from our portfolio investments on an annual basis. And so that takes more time from our investment team. So already our investment team is already getting information from our portfolio investments, both for uh, regulatory and for our, our LPs who have their own uh, needs. What do you think are some of the practical changes that the firm is going to have to make in terms of head count, outside counsel, general costs? I know it's going to be, you know, We would love TBD. to have general counsel, but we can't, you know, that's not something we can afford yet. That would be awesome. Um, but um, does this mean one more person on the finance team? A, you know, I mean, what's the, what do you think this means for the overall overhead for, you know, fund managers of a similar size and in, in maybe $500 million uh, funds? Yeah, it's hard for me to say exactly because we can, you know, we were looking to hire people in our accounting department right now. And some of those, they'll get a little piece of the compliance here, a little piece of compliance there. So um, it's just, um, I can't say exactly what it is. Um, uh, I'm probably afraid to go actually count it all up to see what we are spending. <laughs> and it's also, I mean, I think the industry is also thinking through, you know, how their operating models have to change. And in the, in the coming you know, months. Um, well, well, now kind of unrelated to business, let's talk about community impact. And I'm, you know, I, I, I saw that you were, you've been involved with the Joy School for a number of years. And I'm, I always love to learn just how community impact it play, plays a role in your life. Uh, yeah. So first off, what is the Joy School? Okay. So the Joy School, um, has had an incredible impact on my life. Um, one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. The backdrop to that is um, I have two children. My eldest is special needs. And um, when my daughter was about two, two and a half, it was really obvious she was not developing as expected. Um, I was working then at, at a private equity firm that I just, I loved. I would never have left. It was the best, you know, best job in the world. Um, but you know, it was, I couldn't balance both. I was working 40 or 50 hours a week, which was considered part-time and trying to, to meet Katie's needs. And so I opted to go non-traditional. So that's my non-traditional years and got her settled in the new school. You know, she was going to about seven therapies a week. Um, and so I started doing consulting, uh, so I'd have flexibility. Um, and then 
had just kind of set up a, a, my own firm to, to, to do cons, continue to do consulting and then do some smaller private equity investments. Um, and that was 1997. So Katie was now five and we could see she had had a good year and a bad year at the school where she was. She needed something more. And we had uh, a, a family friend who had done research on children with learning disabilities. He introduced us to a young teacher who wanted to go back and get her master's and we made a deal for her to teach Katie. Turned out they convinced us that there were a lot of kids that had issues. And so I said, look, if get some kids, we'll make a classroom. If it works, we'll make a school. And so that's what we did in the first couple of weeks. You could see Katie and the other kids were much happier. And so we started with four kids who went to 18 and 30 the next, you know, next two years and grew it. And um, it's now in its 25th year anniversary, um, serving about 150 plus kids. And I ran the whole business side for the first seven years. So I did my consulting in energy finance and et cetera. And then I uh, ran the business side until we could afford a full-time business manager. And that's where I really, that was the first company I really built. I mean, and, and you know, two page business plan. Um, and because really looking at is how do we create something that's sustainable um, and survives the founder um, and, you know, it was to help my daughter, which it really did, but it also helped so many other kids and families. So, so how do you think that building the Joy School has impacted how you have built EIV and the culture? It has had a huge impact. So when we starting the Joy School, uh, one of the things I remember, Shara, our lead teacher, who's now headmaster said, we need to invest in our teachers. They are professionals. We need to send them to educational uh, events. And I've forgotten exactly what the number, I won't quote it because it just seems outrageous, but it was an outrageous number for a year, uh, significant compared to their salary uh, benefits, et cetera. And, and she was right. Um, it was really important. She also said all the teachers need to eat lunch together. That meant I had to go do lunch duty with the kids to watch the kids while they're eating lunch and playing on the playground and get some other parents to come do it so that the teachers could eat lunch together. I'm like, this is crazy. She was right. They need that time to collaborate. They need that time to say, I tried this, I tried that. And someone else goes, well, did you try this or this? And so one, listen to your managers. <laughs> you know, that's where I go. They know the business the best. Um, Trust them. Uh, two, collaboration is really important. Um, and bringing together people who have different backgrounds, different approaches, think differently, can lead to a better outcome. And that's how we run our investment process too. Um, also, I learned to appreciate people's differences. So I do not want a team where we all look, act the same, have the same backgrounds. Um, it can lead to communication issues. So we invest in executive coaching, you know, because you have to learn how to hear someone. I'm not the best communicator. You know, I sometimes don't get stuff out of my head. Um, and so you learn, you know, how do you support each other? How do you... Um, learn to listen and take the time to hear what people are saying and then appreciate that other people have a lot to offer. You just have to give them the space and the time to listen to them. So I think that has been very influential for EIV and in how we think about our teams and not wanting everyone to come from the same place. I love that. And it makes me wonder when you kind of went the non-traditional path, I think there are so many parents out there, the moms and dads who are just wrestling with how do I actually integrate and balance on one side? I feel like I, I'm ready to go now. Like this is my time for business. Oh, there's this family thing. How, how have you 
and and I've noticed this with our our journey because now we're in our late 30s. We have a two-year-old and a five-year-old. We have our nonprofit activities. We have our endurance activities. And then it's like, am I putting the same level of effort into being a quality father? Or am I putting like an Iron Man effort into being a father? And so I'm you know, curious to see what is your advice on how to get that appropriate balance and so that you can succeed as a professional, you can succeed as a, uh, as a partner to the family, as a father, a husband, et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, when I got out of business school, I, I wanted to have a family and I wanted to have a professional career. And I had no intention of not continuing to work while I had a family. Um, and I think that's definitely possible. Definitely, you know, having a good partner, all of that helps. Um, you know, I hit a roadblock with Katie, having a special needs child who doesn't sleep at night, who doesn't, you know. And as I said, it, it was one of the best things, you know, it's hard to believe I can say that this now, it didn't feel like at the time, but uh, what a blessing uh, to take me off of that roller coaster or that treadmill or whatever it is. And, you know, force me to see things a different way. So one of the things when I talk to other parents about the, you know, we were during the 80s being taught or, you know, you can have it all as, you know, this was the, uh, as a woman, you can have it all, you can have family, you can have professional life. And sometimes I say you can have it all, but maybe not at the same time. It depends on your situation. You know, we're blessed to live a lot longer, which actually someone was attributing to energy uh, recently. You know, we all live much longer today because we eat better, we have great medicine, etc. But um, I, I wanted to come back, for example, into private equity. I put a plan together so I could keep my hand in it, but also have that flexibility I needed to put my family um, on, you know, I'll, at the end of the day, it's your family that matters, right? You, you know, doesn't matter how successful you are, if, you're, if your family, your children, your, your siblings, whoever are, are suffering, that's, that's not good at the end of the day. Um, you won't be happy with yourself. So I encourage people to think about how to balance, what's important, and realize that you don't have to have everything at the same time. Um, and, you know, you, you certainly, my parents sacrifice. I mean, anyone going through the depression, you know, all the things that they did to provide better opportunities for the next generation, um, you know, it's just play the long game. You know, I started EIB at 49. Most people are, you know, thinking, um, you know, my, my peers are all talking about retirement. And I'm thinking, I have no intention of retiring. I was blessed to get to continue to have intellectual challenges work, build the school, be able to be home, travel with the kids, you know, take, have more flexibility. And, um, and now I, I get to do what I had wanted to do, you know, um, earlier in my career. So, you know, you just, you make the best decisions you can at the time. Um, Kids are pretty, um, they hang in there. They can deal with a lot. Um, uh, you know, so and just don't beat yourself up too much. Um, it's the main, I, <laughs> main thing. <laughs> I love that on, a, on so many levels. Like, you know, you can have everything you want, but not at the same time. I think that is a very good reminder. And I think it also allows us to be okay with, pausing, not stopping something. Yeah. And, re and then because people who are ambitious, people who do have broad interest, they do want to do everything at the same time, the serial entrepreneur, and you get 50 ideas and you just want to get that energy out there. Um, but I think that's such a great perspective that you can have it all, but just not at the same time. And then, and then also just the you know, reframing of what is important and that everything we are doing, 
with business, et cetera, it doesn't really matter if there's not that stable foundation with the family. And it's, you know, helping to uh, cut through the clutter and the noise to help remember, like, this is what's important. Everything else is just building on top of that. That's right. Yes. And, and, and I think everybody has to do, everyone has to come up with it themselves, right? So it's not important what's important to someone else. It's what's important to you. To the other point, you started this at 49. You started a business. And most people, as you were you know, saying is like, that's when they're like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to ride and coast. And you're like, no, I'm just getting started. And I think that's so encouraging for people to hear in that, listen to yourself. What do you want to do? And go off and swing for it. Yeah. What the, the last question is really around, you know, specifically with women in business and women in finance, because this is Women's History Month. Is there any kind of specific advice you have for? you know, women in private equity or women in the finance industry that is something practical and like very actionable. And it could be for women who are beginning their careers or mid-career or later at a later chapter in their career. So I think it goes for everybody, but I think particularly for women is build your network you know, professional, personal. Um, and I think I've enjoyed over the last decade, there have been a lot more events or organizations that bring women together that are in the same career. So for, for, um, uh, for private equity, you know, what I realized I missed in the 80s and 90s and then whenever is, you know, I do think differently than most of the guys in the room. I have different points of view. Um, there's a lot that we agree on, but I might get there somewhat differently or have a different point of view. And I didn't realize that. Um, and so it, it provides some, I've found some comfort or, or some affirmation of, being able to share some experiences or feelings and finding out that these other women felt that same way. And then that's made me more confident to then speak out when I'm in a the typical group of all guys to say, okay, here's what I'm thinking. And I, I think here's one example. So one of my um, male partners, um, the last several years has said, I don't think we should put titles on our emails. It doesn't matter if you're an associate or a partner, you're met, you know, you still represent EIB. What you say is just as important if you're whatever level. And I didn't really respond to it for, I just ignored it because, you know, and finally, I finally realized why I wasn't willing to do that. And uh, it was the morning I was meeting, having coffee with an attorney that I hadn't met before, uh, a woman. And, and I said, hey, let me just run this by you. So here's what he's saying, you know, but it, I realized if I take my title off, then they're going to assume that I'm the assistant, his assistant. I'm supposed to do the, the scheduling, which I'm horrible at scheduling. Um, and, and she said, well, well, of course you wouldn't do that. Yeah, of course they're gonna think that. And that didn't happen to me just a couple of weeks earlier that someone had just assumed I was not on the investment side um, or had any, any, um, any stroke at the firm. Uh, and so I, I told him that later, he, he was flabbergasted. He had no idea that that was an issue for me or for any other woman. Uh, and so, it's not a big deal. It's just part of what it is. Uh, but I never voiced it I because it was in the back of my mind somewhere. Uh, I, I knew there was a reason that I needed to put my title on that I didn't agree with him. But it was so buried that it took a while for it to really bubble up to say, okay, 
yeah, well, this is why. Um, so um, I think it's much better today, you know, and with COVID, I think there's probably more of an appreciation for those um, of, of, of the roles that partners play um, and taking care of kids. Working from home is very difficult with kids in the background. Um, and so I think, um, I think just being more open and sharing, here's what's going on and, uh, uh, and then sharing, here's my perspective and being allowed to say your perspective. It just, it's just a lot more comfortable when they're more, more of the same people in the room that look like you and have similar backgrounds, whether that's women, minorities. Yep. And I think the key takeaway there for me and I've seen this through other organizations that I'm involved with, like we have a nonprofit for transitioning veterans, is that when you are around people who are similar and you talk about the business, you talk about the job, you just hear different perspectives and you need to be around your tribe to get the different perspective, which is a, a case for the, the subgroups but then also making sure that those subgroups do invite that outside perspective. Um, because sometimes it, it, you're the person who made the point about the email title, it just wasn't an issue. You didn't know it. It, it, it wasn't in front of mind. But because you had that discussion with them, it allowed to have that outside perspective. Well, we just covered a whole bunch of topics. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thanks so much yeah. for doing this. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it, Jordan. All right. See ya.